Ms. Adelian, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, that was today. That's why. <sighs> so. Everybody's doing today. Good. How you doing? Hey, how's it going, Jen? Very good. Happy uh, early Mother's Day. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Joni, you're still on mute. I see you. You got the camera on there. Everybody's gonna go on mute soon. You gotta. In like one minute's time. What to tell you? What would you like to hear from me? Oh, tell I'm just me. saying everybody's going to go on mute. Happy, happy early Mother's Day. How are you doing tonight? I am good. good. Thank you very much. Always good to hear your voice, Johnny. Thank you. I see Ms. Sheehan. Do we have uh, the mayor? Looks like I have Jackie Doherty's address showing up, but I don't see her. Camera. Jim, have you been I tabulating committee oh. members? I think we have everybody right now. We you do have, have everybody. Mayor. Yep. Is the mayor around? Uh, the mayor's ready. So if the mayor would like to start. 
Before we do, Mr. Mayor, can we, Jim, can you make sure you mute everybody and okay. also cancel out video feeds other than committee members? Uh, speakers, if you're signed up to speak, your video feed and, and uh, microphone will come live at that time. Uh, but to, in order to manage it, anybody that can start on their own by canceling out their audio and video feed, that helps Jim in trying to moderate. All right, I'm going to mute all and then I'm going to unmute um, the members and the administrators. All right, thank you. Y'all set? Um... Can you hear me, John? We on mute. We uh, should not be on mute. Let's see. You're off mute now. Yeah, we're off. Mute. You're off, Mary. Okay. I see Hillary's just went off. Andy's good. Mike Dillon still has his on mute. Uh, Jim, is that intentional? I'm still trying to find him. All right, he's at the top of screen. Mike, can you hear us? He saw mute yet. There he goes. Now he's good. Looks like Jackie Doherty's still on mute, Jim. Uh, she's unmuted now. Yep, she's good now. Uh, Robin Desmond's still muted, as is Latifa. Where is she on the screen? Latifa should be. You, got, you just got Latifa. You got Robin. Andy's All right, fine. Andy Hello. looks good. Bob looks good. Billy Joe still needs unmuting. <laughs> uh, you might be muted on your side, Billy Joe, because I'm hitting it and it's not I'm doing. Okay. There she is. She's good now. All right, we still have some video feeds live, Jim, but I imagine you'll work through those. Uh, okay. Mr. Mayor, if you're uh, if you're ready, it looks like everybody's uh, looks like every committee member is unmuted and live on their video. Okay. So why don't we do the salute to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag, to the flag United of the United States, States, States of America, America. the Republic for which it stands, for which it stands one nation, one nation God, under God, God, God indivisible, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Justice for all. Thank you. Uh, roll call. Mayor Leahy? Here. Ms. Martin? Here. Ms. Clark? Here. Mr. Jacobo? Here. Mr. Dillon? Here. Ms. Doherty? Here. Mr. Hoey? Here. Seven present. Thank you. Um, tonight we have a couple of um, memorials. Mr. Dillon? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. I just want to mention uh, Brian Dillon passed away. Um, it was actually a couple weeks ago uh, on April 4th. Um, but he was a member of the class in 1974 and a member of the Lowell High Athletic Hall of Fame. Um, very well respected wrestler back in the 70s and uh, just wanted that to be known. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I also have a moment of silence for Barbara Hodge. Uh, she's a retired executive secretary for the Lowell School System. Oh. And I'd also like to... Uh, mention everyone that has passed away since our last meeting. If we could just have a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, that brings us to special order of business uh, 3.1. This meeting is being held remotely in accordance with the governor of Massachusetts, his order on March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general mass laws, uh, chapter 30A, section 20. Uh, next, we have 3.2, 2020, 2020-2021 district-wide strategic plan and 21 <laughs> service level line item budget. Mr. Manager, I mean, um, Mr. 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 Superintendent. Understand yeah. certainly the confusion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There is the uh, first, if I could, just a point of privilege. Typically, in uh, a week such as this, we might have the spotlight item on our agenda because this is Teacher Appreciation Week. We haven't yet found a way to do these spotlights quite well virtually, but I do want to recognize all of our teachers during Teacher Appreciation Week. I want to recognize our principals for the past Principal Appreciation Day, recognize all of our cafeteria and nutrition staff on the past. Uh, Lunch Heroes Day and recognize our school nurses for today is 
School Nurses Day. So uh, we greatly appreciate all of the work that everyone is doing. So on behalf of the committee and on behalf of the city, thank you for all of your hard work uh, today and every day. Mr. Mayor uh, and committee members, uh, today you'll notice that the agenda item before you is not a written recommendation. I'm looking forward to the committee's questions, guidance, and advice, but the budget book that we'll look at tonight should not be viewed as my recommended budget for FY21 or even my proposed budget for FY21. I'm actually not recommending that the committee take any formal action other than to receive the budget book as a report of progress to enable continued transparent discussion and responsible fiscal planning in light of the many economic uncertainties brought about by COVID-19. We are just two months from the transition from one fiscal year to another. So having this line item budget in front of the committee tonight and using it as a basis for continued thoughtful discussion is an important step in providing complete transparency to the community as we work to meet the demands of the budget calendar. However, as the mayor has stressed repeatedly since we began these discussions, there remains a significant number of critical variables for which we do not have the certainty we normally would expect. There are still far too many unknowns for the committee to responsibly adopt any type of FY21 budget at this time. The budget outline within the book that was made public on Friday was built in a way that enables us as a district to continue to move forward with the required budgeting calendar while still remaining flexible to the evolving context we find ourselves in. It is designed based on just one of many plausible scenarios of what revenue might look like for LPS in FY21. A scenario in which the district receives only 50% of the increase from the governor's January proposal. Although it is highly unlikely, it is still possible that the funding contemplated for school districts in the governor's pre-COVID budget will remain intact. Unfortunately, there are several indications, mostly unofficial ones, that that will not be the case. As finance chair Martin stated during our subcommittee meeting, it is actually quite possible that we may receive even less revenue than the $6.7 million of new money required for the line item budget in front of you tonight. One way or another, we will likely need to adjust in potentially in significant ways as the revenue picture becomes more clear. At this point, the only guidance we have received from DESE is to be prudent, but avoid creating chaos in the community. We believe the conversation tonight reasonably strikes that balance. A few points to keep in mind before Ms. Turner walks the committee through this draft budget book. One, we are expecting the grant application window to open for the K-12 provision of the Federal CARES Act this week or next. Depending on the size and stipulations of the grant, it could significantly alter our known revenue despite the larger scale uncertainties. We will keep the committee apprised when we receive that official information. Two, all of the contracts the district currently has with its bargaining unit will expire on June 30th. Those conversations and negotiations remain active, and this line item budget does not account for any perceived or forecasted outcomes to those negotiations. To remain consistent with past discussions, within this budget book, all of the contractually required salary increases which took place or are required to take place this fiscal year for both affiliated and non-affiliated personnel are consolidated within one line item of $5.4 million. That line should be viewed as a fixed cost increase. In future versions of the budget book, that $5.4 million will be distributed among the relevant employee salary lines. It should not be confused with the ongoing negotiations of future for future years. Three, there is a detailed accounting breakdown of the school-based budgets within the budget book and a response to the committee's request for a further narrative analysis of the rationale for each item within the $2 million of increases to school budgets will be provided by 513. Four, there are two outstanding motions related to job descriptions, which I know the committee is interested in receiving prior to adoption of the FY21 budget. One from committee member Doherty and one from committee member Dillon. Responses to both will be provided at the next scheduled committee meeting on the 20th. Again, no action is recommended tonight. Five, and this one is of some urgency for the district. The timetable for, for us to utilize the FY20 cost savings resulting from the closure, largely the savings from our pre-COVID budget forecast for transportation and substitute, savings which are essential to purchasing much needed mobile devices for our students for next year. Ms. Turner will speak to that timeline and the options before the committee. And the committee should keep in mind uh, that we may need to schedule a special session next week to encumber those funds. 
we are aware that there are some percolating statewide discussions regarding some type of legislative waiver, allowing funds to be carried forward into the next fiscal year, but we don't currently anticipate that waiver being available to the committee. And six, and lastly, this draft budget, as, with, as will be the case with any budget that is brought before the committee in the future, is part of a coherent approach to funding our 28 schools and our district-wide strategic plan, which defines our systemic commitment to equity and places the needs of our students at the center of every decision. This is the key part that is often lost in the budgeting process, which is why you see the combined item for both the strategic plan and the budget in tonight's agenda. Connecting our budget to a coherent approach, namely the strategic plan, maximizes the chances that our investments are both efficient and effective. Efficient in the sense that it is easier as an organization to recognize when expenditures are somehow duplicative and effective in that by leveraging our collective organizational strength, we are better positioned to move all of our goals forward on behalf of Lowell's 14,500 students. The budget outline in tonight's budget book does that while adhering to a speculative scenario of 50% less new money coming into the district. An extraordinary budgetary challenge that was met in part by reducing administrative headcount in central office without requiring any furloughs or layoffs and shifting those dollars to schools. And also again, leveraging the operational savings realized during the closure. With that, I'll turn the microphone over to Ms. Turner and I look forward to the committee's continued input as we navigate these unchartered waters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I don't have share screen privileges. I believe we have some speakers. Mr. Mayor, would you like uh, Ms. Turner to continue or would you like speakers at this time? Go ahead, Billy Joe. Mayor's still muted, uh, Jim. Um, he shouldn't be. Do you see him? All right. I think it's on your end, Mayor. Okay. All right. Mr. Mayor, do you want Ms. Turner to continue or would you like speakers? Well, I'm going to say, should we do the speakers first and then let us get into it? Why don't we do that? Yep. Am I uh, muted? Jim, do you not? have the list? No, nope, you're on okay, Mr. Mayor. Okay. No, I have the list. All right. Start. Yep. So I'll have the clerk read the names. Thank you. Um, first speaker regarding the budget is Fred McOscar. Fred, I'm here. How okay. is everyone doing? Good. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, I'm just. I'll be brief. I know you've got a lot of work before you tonight. Um, and Billy Joe will find a couple of million dollars somewhere right now. Um, I'm calling to speak to the position about the reduction in force of uh, district support specialists. Uh, I had this position in the Lowell Public Schools for over 14 years. Um, it's not a position that's out in the front pages of the newspaper. Most of the children and families we work in, we are worked with were disenfranchised, poor, homeless, are really unaware of their own rights. So district support specialists over the years have worked collaboratively with principals, superintendents, families, community agencies to assure that the needs of the student come first. And secondly, that the everyone is whole, that we're also protecting the district's role in any problem solving case, as well as advocating for the child in terms of what they deserve through the school. Our primary, the primary job of district support specialist, it's really student support specialist. It's making sure that when we're making decisions, we're looking through a lens of what's in the student's best interest and what can we do as an educational institution to make sure we address problems for that student. Um, there's a large amount of community collaboration, particularly with DCF um, community teamwork. We have a substantial number of children who are homeless and also members of the Department of Children and Family mm -hmm. Resources. It is essential that we have someone trained, licensed, knowledgeable, and professional to interact with these agencies. Um, there are so many other overlapping regulations, be it special education, uh, processes of appeal, timely submission of appeals, 
all those have to be followed. Um, there have been cases where we have addressed situations where children would have been an out of district placement to the tune of $100,000, but through the work of a district support specialist, it was determined that that child actually lived in another community and that money went there. So those are things that particularly on scene every day. Um, I've had families that I've, in my 14 years there, um, that I've followed from grade one to the time they graduated from high school. And it was primarily problem solving with parents, um, a number of parents or guardians who did not have the capability of interacting with the school, but needed support guidance and needed a clear voice and recommendation from someone who they trusted. So it was really about working relationships with parents, children, colleagues, so that our interventions were valued and brought resolution, hope to families and children. So I hope as you review the budget, I know you've got an awful lot to do money-wise. Um, remember the student support specialists are professionally trained, licensed, um, bilingual, and very well connected with the community and uh, skilled at addressing some of the barriers that these families face in getting their children to school. I wanna thank you all for your time, stay safe and healthy. And uh, the motto of district support specialist is no job too big, no job too small. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Um, okay. Sure. The Mary. second speaker, uh, Luz Vasudevan. Are you there, Luz? I don't see um, Luz in the meeting. Okay. I believe it's loose. And not, uh, it is loose. <laughs> I apologize. Next year. Uh, Janice Rosario. Uh, Miss Rosario is here. Miss Rosario, can you hear us? Yes, I can. It's your turn to speak. Yes. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Good. So you, you have a five minutes to speak on the budget? Um, well, I am here to speak in behalf of the, the student support. Okay. Um, not per se budgeting, but the student support personnel that I have had the pleasure to work with in the last 15, 16 years. Um, getting assistance, support, um, mediation. They have been my liaisons and my connections with the public schools throughout all these years with both of my children. And um, I strongly believe that, you know, the, the student support uh, specialists are a great asset to have, especially for the uh, Latino community. If um, we, as Latino community, we have been underserved for so long and having the, having the positions available there and the people available to connect with us, not only in the issues that we might have or encounter or endure through the, through the schooling of our, of our children, but also because they're able to understand where, they come, where we're coming from and they're able to connect more and have the families open up more to people that they relate to um, is very important. Um, for me, it worked for me. I learned a lot. Um, like um, I learned how to be the best advocate for my own children and learning from them draw, drew me to be working in the human service field where I can work with families in the community as well. So I think that um, the positions are very important, especially because Latino, the Latino community in Lowell 
is not a minority anymore. We are a big community here. And I would like to have to see um, you know, the 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 specialist, the support specialist, uh, be able to to relate, to be able to relate. They are they they are the biggest support that the Latino families have, not only to they're not there to lecture us, they're there to support us and to guide us and to mm, to teach us to understand the system, the, all the systems that comes around. I mean, when we come from other countries, well, sometimes there is a misperception of how things work, and uh, from both parts, you know, from the sis, from the district, and from the families. And it is very important to have the people that are knowledgeable, that have the experience enough to understand that we're coming from different countries, and we we need to learn, to kind of like adjust to the new the new the new home the new educational system. Um, right now, my, my youngest just graduated last year from Lowell High, but um, I have a granddaughter that in maybe a year and a half, two years, will be entering the Lowell Public Schools. Um, she is a child with disabilities, so um, I'm hoping that we have those uh, support specialists there so my daughter doesn't have to have that fight alone that my daughter also can learn from them to advocate for my granddaughter and to continue um, this work. I have worked personally with um, Fred in the past. Um, I worked with Nancy. Um, I have worked in work experience with um, Rosa. Um, through, I used to work at NFI Family Resource Center, so um, the great connection there with Rosa and the support that she gave to the families that came as a refugees from the hurricane in Puerto Rico was extraordinary. The impact that she made for um, the families. Unfortunately, I was not being able to be part of that um, group of people that were connecting personally because I did have my personal losses. I lost my sister two days after the hurricane. So my, my job was trying to protect me emotionally from the impact of dealing with the people that came. But I know that Rosa did a tremendous work and I, I still, I'm still very grateful that um, she was very involved in that and she was very welcoming. It was not an unfamiliar face for um, the Latino to come from Puerto Rico and with the struggle and the trauma and Rosa was there with the great face and the great smile that she has to welcome them here and, and guide them through and support them. Okay, is that, are you all set then? Yes. All right, thank you very much. And yes, the Latino community um, is very important to us in Lowell and appreciate your comment. Thank you, thank you very much. But we have the previous uh, scheduled speaker on on the call now, Mayor. All right. Is everybody? Um, it seems to be bouncing around. Are we muting everyone except the speakers? Or are yeah. we able to do that? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so he the previous. previous. You want to read? Um, sure. What was the name again, Mr. Hall? Who's for the Ms. Luz, 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 can you hear? Yep. Okay. I'm sorry, I do call in my name. I just got in. I am sorry. Okay. It's okay. Thank you. Go ahead, please. What am I going to speak now? Yes, yes. you're all set to speak. Yeah. Oh my God, I, I was just completely. Okay, so <laughs> I am here. Okay. I am Luz Vasudeva. Uh, I, I used to be in an organization called Latinx Community Center for Empowerment, and I am also a tutor for the Lowell Public Schools. And I have been very involved with the community about the Lowell High School students and how important it is for them to have a bilingual person, for them to be able to find a familiar and a voice that can listen to them and be able to advocate for them. And I'm very happy 
that I was given the opportunity to be able to help them. And I think it's very, very important for the bilingual people in the public schools to advocate and be there for the, the kids that are in a big, big need. Before, even before the pandemia. So I think um, it is, uh, I'm sorry, but I just, I thought the meeting was at 7 p.m. and then I realized it was at 6.30, so it got me a little bit. You're doing great. Kind of. <laughs> I just feel like I, I feel like a little overwhelmed because I was getting ready for this and then I got in and I was like in a meeting before this meeting with the JAMA. I don't know if the, I'm sure that the city of Lowell is aware of the JAMA organization. So I hung up the phone there and I said, okay, let me relax before the school meeting. And then it's like, oh my Lanta. Hillary sent me a text, are you there? Your name was called. And I'm like, oh, so I got in. And so, but I just feel like the bilingual um, yeah. helpers in the school department are a big need for the community. And I hope that uh, we are going to keep involved with the community and the kids are really, I have been working very closely with a couple of teachers in the high school. And a lot of kids didn't have uh, uh, Chromebooks. And I have to thank Latifa and Hillary for helping me advocating for these kids because they were under the assumption that if they had an iPhone or if they have another device in their houses, they didn't qualify for Chromebooks. And it was impossible for these kids to do their assignments in a phone. I mean, can you imagine yourself? I mean, even though the kids are on their phones all day long, if they are doing school work, it's very difficult for them to do school work in, in an iPhone or a Android or whatever it's called. So we are very, very... Okay, you cut out again? Call me, one of them called me tears, saying thank you, Luz, thank you, thank you, because he is a senior and he was very, very worried that he was not going to be able to do all the school work in the phone. So I just want to say thank you and I hope things continue to improve. Okay, thank You're you welcome. very much for your comments. Appreciate it. Uh, next speaker, Hi, Jennifer. Jennifer. Yes, hi everyone, I'm here. Um, Yes, let me just try to get my video on so I can say hello properly. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Balala. I work for Coalition for a Better Acre. I am the Youth Development Coordinator, and um, I found it a big important part of my job to do school advocacy for our families. Um, and I think this uh, the support, the student support positions that we're speaking of is part of the school advocacy that I do for our families because of, you know, the lack of um, communication that the families can receive. So I help uh, different families from different cultures, whether it be Hispanic or from the African cultures, from the Arabic cultures um, that we have in our city. Uh, the need for the communication and the need for support staff is crucial because as we've all been kind of bombarded by this pandemic and we've had to readjust and, you know, accept our new normal and education has been a big, big transition, not only for the school system, but of course for our family. Most of our families out there, as we know, are low income. Their, um, their education level might not be to the level where they're understanding the process and the information that's being sent out to them. So support staff is crucial for these families. I have personally worked with two specific families that have, um, have had this need. Um, one, is, uh, one family is Hispanic and I am not bilingual. So the communication between me and the school and the parent has been quite challenging, but with it all said, we've been successful. But we've only been successful because I have been advocating for that family and 
you know, uh, reaching out to my resources to help me translate. So the bilingual piece is very crucial. Um, and also the information that the families are receiving has to be in a manner where they understand. Um, and again, that whole translation, whether it be bilingual or whether it just be a, a more simpler terms for families to understand, even our families that are American citizens that have been born and raised here. Um, so that support is very, very crucial in the children's education. And so I believe, and this is how I've been able to help my families, is that no matter whether they're Hispanic, African, Arabic, no matter what culture, and no matter what culture I'm from, my job as an advocate is to understand their culture, understand their needs, and understand where they're confused. So I can be that link with the school system as well, you know, and the parents, because all in all, it's the children who really will suffer. And these parents want to be a support for their children. They just don't know how, and they just don't really know how to navigate the system. So that link, again, I cannot emphasize how crucial that link is for our kids to be successful. Um, so, I mean, with that said, I think um, as uh, other speakers have mentioned, the misconception of the school system is a big deal amongst our immigrant families, because when you go to other countries, it's totally different. I have been out of the country, I have family from Kenya, and the school, they don't worry about the kids in school, the teachers, the principals, the superintendents, they know right, they know everything, they don't worry about it. So that need for family support is not really as crucial as it is in our system, all they have to do is really pay, <laughs> you know, where our system, we have that ability to be able to offer free education and, you know, to offer um, that support that family needs so our system can understand the individual needs of each child and each family. So, I mean, I just wanted to have my voice heard so um, our system knows how very important it is to have these and how nonprofit agencies like Coalition for a Better Acre, how we have stepped up to try to be that for our families because we have the um, relationship with them. They trust us, you know, so that, that relationship is just key. And as one of the speakers had mentioned, it was a familiar face. It was a friendly face. It was someone who cares. It was someone who could understand our struggle. So with that said, um, I just think as, and as Lou said, we just need to continue getting better. We have made many strides and in regard to the hardware. It has been a nightmare. Thank you for everybody doing what they can to make sure our kids get what they need. And I also had a family member who was in low high school who called me and said, what happened? Because I was with Luz on trying to advocate for those kids to have laptops, especially the high school students. And she called me and she's like, what did you do? I said, nothing. I, I just said what our families needed because she got a phone call within, I think, two days saying that she can come and pick up a laptop for her child. So these are the like success stories that we can tell and um, just the support that our family needs. So thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much, Hello, Speaker. Jen Parasol. Jen, are you out there? No. I'm here. Okay. Go ahead, Jen, we're all set. Hi, right. thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm here just to discuss um, the two positions that are being considered for reducing in the Central Administration Office. These two positions are um, executive secretarial positions, and they are also promotional um, opportunities for clerical um, staff. As you know, over the years, I have always stressed about, you know, we are the backbone of the administrations, um, all the administrators throughout the school system. And over the past years, we have our um, membership has been reduced to 35%, which is now, if you eliminate these two positions, um, it would bring us to 65, 35% um, totally. So we have 65 secretaries working for the entire school system. And that's including the high school, all the schools, and um, 
middle, elementary, the alternative settings. So we really need these positions to be open. I'm not saying to be filled right at this moment, but they are very important positions for our membership. And I believe that if once the funds come in, we do have that these two positions have been posted already and applicants have applied. And I just want to tell you that we need these positions because the work isn't getting smaller, it's larger. And when there's no people to do that job, it gets passed down to other departments and other people are working even more harder for the same pay. And I just think we really need to keep these positions open. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Okay. Have a good one. Thank you. Yep, one more. Um, Lorna King Kiplicket. I apologize if I messed that up. Are you out there, Lorna? I see your name, Mr. Mayor. What's that? I see her name, Mr. Mayor. I, I haven't heard her speak yet, but I see her name and she's unmuted. Okay. Lorna, are you ready? Tell. There's no video feed, so I can't tell if she's at the computer or not. All right. All right. Why don't we have Ms. Turner go then? All right. Okay. Ms. Turner? Can you, do I have share screen? I need the share screen. Okay, so the budget is um, the budget book that you received for the FY21 budget um, fiscal year is divided into different sections. I'll briefly go over them so that you know what you have in front of you. You have a draft um, budget narrative. This is in draft format, being that we don't have the concrete information that we need to um, make it final. We have a district wide budget tab. That's the tab that I'm going to go over page by page. We have a staff salary book. I wanted to um, point out that because, we're, because we have collective bargaining going on now and we, um, the contracts are going to end, we put the current salary, not next year's salary. We don't have a grid for next year. So I wanted to emphasize that so that no one is concerned when they see current salary in that section. Then there's a grant section. As you know, the allocations for grants are not released until the summer. So this is based upon information we have right now. The school profiles, that's informational um, data for each of the schools. And the last section is fair student funding. That's the section that many of you have asked about. It's the section that will show a funding source for each school and um, it will show the budget tool for each school. The funding source page is important because many people advocate for their schools thinking they should have more. They think they have the most poor kids, they have the most bilingual kids, not understanding that in comparison to the other schools, they may not have as many as they thought. So the funding source page will actually break down why they got the amount they got and people could actually compare school to school to understand why they received the allocation that they received. I'm going to jump right into the district-wide budget section so that we can go page by page. Just so you know, I'm trying to figure out how to minimize faces so I can see the budget book. The budget is divided into different sections so that you understand the overall document. It's divided into administration. So any administration cost the first, then you'll see a teaching services, pupil services, operations and maintenance, employee benefits, asset and rooms with other districts. If we go into the first, 1000 series, which is administration, you'll see that the school committee personnel and school committee page, there are no changes. Can you oh. see the, can you see it in front of you? What do you mean by no yes. changes? So no changes have not been any additions or subtractions. So let me just point out that can you, if I you mean, can see what I have in front Mr. of me, I'll Dillon show you. In there, though, right? Yeah, he would, he would have replaced the previous, um, yes, the previous school committee so yes, that shows for the full committee. The seventy-two thousand is for the full, full committee. But I didn't see his name. Well, his name. That's because if right here, I'm not showing any names. But if you look in the salary book, is where the current um, unit shows. So again, it's not for next year. So we can look into why he didn't show up on that payroll. If you're talking about the staff salary book, 
Yeah, I'm just confused. I didn't know I didn't show up. Okay, well, the, I'll look into that, but that's not, you definitely, the amount is in here. So the amount is definitely reflected in the budget itself. Yeah, we, did, we didn't We didn't cut Mr. Dillon's um, election. No, I know, but the page I saw had everybody's name with their salary, and it, so his salary wasn't there. So I'm, I was probably looking on another page. No, you're right. You're right, Mayor. Um, it's on the staff salary page when yep. we drafted that. It was probably the current. Um, you know, if he, if he, did you get paid yet? Uh, yeah, no, I can speak to that a little bit. That's, I mean, no, I'm not on the payroll, so that is a work in progress. I would. That's probably why consideration in the budget in the future, uh, because I would hope to change that situation. But I appreciate uh, the mayor. Um, being above it. Okay. All right. Continue. Thank you. So there's no change to the school committee page. The superintendent page, um, there is a change. There was a $50,000 reduction to the contracted services strategic planning line. This was a one time cost for this year. By the way, I just want to let you know that this is the current year right here, the FY21 year. It's divided into two sections the general fund and the grant offset. Um, Section. The general fund change is right here. This is to help you track the $6.7 million that we had to cut. So, on the next section, the 1400 section, which is the finance administration, we did break out the clerical staff from central administration and special ed so that we can have more clarity. Um, we do have a reduction of two clerks. Can I just ask, um, we're just doing a general overview, right? Yes, do you want, do you have a suggestion for something well, different? I can do, just, I could approach it differently. Let me just ask, um, so it's my understanding that the meeting went offline on LTC, on the computer and on TV, so. I think the computer's okay, it's just TV. Well, I just got TVs, oh. computers up. So, I don't know, should we keep going with this, Dr. Boyd, or should we? Yeah, we can, what we can do is we can, uh, Ms. Dr. Hall, if you can hit record on your computer. They, they have been kind enough to air it at a later time. Again, there is no batch on this item, and it is, there is a pretty extensive budget hearing timeline. Um, so my recommendation would be to continue. We can record it, and uh, at the reshowing times, they can show the full meeting through recording. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just want to make sure we're aware. Okay. Thank you. So so again, the clerical staff have been um, divided out into two different sections, so that's why the numbers look different. There has been a reduction of two. We also reduced the council for collective bargaining funds by half, by $45,000. The next change in this 1400 um, finance and administration section has, is the contracted services for fair student funding. The project was $50,000. We've completed the project, we did leave $10,000 left in, um, in that account so that when we have a follow-up for next year, we have the tool itself, but we might need some tweaking for the following um, budget year. The next change is on photocopier maintenance. Last year, it was a prorated year when we made the change. This year, it's increased by $78,000. Um, this is the 77 copiers lease. We're no longer going to purchase copiers, we're going to lease them. So we need to we have a lease cost and a maintenance cost. The next change is in the curriculum director. This is the 2000 series. This is all teaching services, all related to teaching. So the next um, change is the director of secondary ed position has been reduced due to fiscal constraints. The coordinator of mathematics and the coordinator of ELA have not been reduced or cut. They've been moved to um, the grant funding section. The coordinator of research testing and assessment has been reduced due to fiscal constraints. The one assistant director of special ed has been reduced due to fiscal constraints. Then any questions? No, this is just an overview, so continue. All right, good. So the principal, the next section is the um, principal and school leadership section. 
We do have an addition of one assistant principal through the fair student funding process. Um, we through that same process, there was a student service specialist for the freshman academy added through the law high school's um, budgeting process. This next section is the 2300 series. The numbers have changed drastically, not, um, not overall. Overall, there were an addition of 20 teachers, but they changed because we're coding them differently. If you're a middle school teacher and you have both a math and a social studies background, we don't know whether to put you in math or social studies and it causes a lot of error. So we, we, we code people as middle school teachers rather than math or social studies being that they could be both. So there's some coding changes here. The thing to note about this section is that we were going to have an initiative for expanding pre-K that had to be paused due to the fiscal constraints. And the other thing to note is the funds for step increases. As the superintendent pointed out, in this budget, we actually combined all of the increases, all the step increases that would occur for each of the staff, staff members into this one line item until the collective bargaining is done. The next um, section that I wanted to point out is occupational physical therapists. If you notice over here, there were 15 and now there are 12. There are not, these are not cut. We did not cut people. What happened is the certified occupational assistants were combined with the occupational therapists and we separated those out for more clarity. So as you can see, it went from 15 to 12 plus four. The same thing happened with speech therapists. We had 28 in one line. That included 24 speech therapists and five speech language therapist assistants. The sign language have, um, interpreters have stayed the same. The BCBAs, I reconciled this with the special ed director. We did not reduce the BCBAs. We clarified the BCBAs. When over here, when there were two grant positions, they never reduced the 11 over here. So this 11 included two additional positions that don't exist. I reconciled this with the special ed director and the payroll system. Evaluation team chairperson stayed the same, 15. Paraprofession paraprofessionals um, for special ed reduced by 15 positions or 16 positions, but then regular ed increased by the same. This was through the basic funding process. We were able to um, reconcile and clarify whether a position was special ed or whether it was regular ed. So these are pretty much even now. Um, one thing to point out is it shows an $815,000 reduction with paraprofessionals. That's only on the general fund side. If you look, the grant went from 854,000 to 1.6 million. We put more of the paras onto a grant because they're not MTRS staff, which means we don't get charged a fee. So we, that was a strategic move on our part. In other words, we put more of the um, paras on a grant. Next section that, um, the next change that is note um, worthy here is the tutors. During the first funding process, there were many tutors added by the principals. So we added a budget of $400,000 on the local budget side. The next section is the 2350 professional development series. Um, the thing to note here is academic coaches. We had three in the budget last year. We're reducing down to one. Math resource coaches, we went from 20 to 17. Again, that was through the math and the fair student funding process. They were allowed, um, allowed to choose whether they wanted a math resource coach this year or not. The, te the tech instructional support specialists were added, uh, they were combined with instructional specialists in previous years. We separated those out so that they're, so it's clear, they're district wide support specialists, whereas instructional specialists are sent to the schools. So these two were once combined. Um, we did go down one literacy specialist from 15 to 14, and that's because of, again, they, um, the schools get to choose, but I don't, we don't have a cut. So I think that was just a, 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 an adjustment as well, like a clarification. The next section is instructional materials and equipment. So as we explained earlier, we did have some significant savings this year due to all of the um, COVID closure. I mean, the, you know, the closure. So we were able to pre-purchase supplies and textbooks and save that money for next year. So this, this line item was reduced due to pre-purchasing supplies and textbooks. 
this section here, last year we had something called school-based resources additional. It's because we received money after the budget had already been approved. So we lumped that into this one line. That was taken out this year, so it shows as a reduction. The actual school-based allocation line increased by $790,000. This is because the schools were going to spend more in school allocations. You asked at the last meeting how much, if we tallied up the technology that the schools wanted to spend this year, it was approximately $420,000 when you tally up all of their, um, all of those that were intended to buy Chromebook parts and things such as that. So that would have been an additional um, $420,000, which would be part of the $790,000 increase. The technology investment here that's highlighted, this was $2 million, but because we have savings for this year, we had proposed um, spending the $2 million now, which would be a double advantage for us. One, it would save us the $2 million from um, spending that next year, but it would also allow us to purchase it early enough so that we have it um, by the time school begins, all the Chromebook that we planned on purchasing. And when are we going to put that? So the transfer tonight that you have on your agenda is um, two transfer funds from salary surpluses and other areas so that we can put it into a technology line. Then the city hall would do the transfer. We would enter the purchase order and make it happen. Okay, before June 30th. No, yeah, we will do it now, like within the next week. And if we do it within, if we order it now, then we're ordering before June 30th, which means I, I, can, I talked to the CFO and the city auditor because my concern was if it didn't arrive before June 30th, but they canceled the purchase order on us. And if they um, canceled the purchase order in the middle of the summer, we would end up getting stuck with a $2 million bill for next year. And that would not, how we wouldn't be able to afford that. So I made sure I spoke to both the city auditor and the city CFO to make sure that was um, you know, doable, where we could actually make the purchase, put the order in before June 30th and still have it available if, it, if for some reason the devices are delayed. Okay, but even if they're delayed, like um, they're back ordered, they're letting, uh, they're letting communities put orders in. That's what they said. I spoke to the city auditor. She is confident that we can because there were three tests, um, three areas to test. One is if you put the order in before June 30th, which we did, the second thing was, is it violating any, any capital asset policies in the city of Lowell? She said they don't exist yet. She's working on that. So no, it doesn't violate any current rules. And, um, and if the school committee approves the part, I mean, the transfer tonight, then we already have the funding. Um, so yes, we're all set to move ahead. Okay, and just one other question. Um, if, how many devices do we need? Like, did we, that was a question at the last meeting. So. We know exactly what our order is going to be and how it gets distributed to each school. Or? Well, I don't know how they'll be distributed, but I know that the quote that we received from the state um, contracted vendor was 9,000 units. How do they know? How we, this, there's we a, gave them that amount. Their number came from an inventory done by our technology curriculum team. Uh, so Ms. Desmond is, uh, I believe I, Ms. Desmond was on there. I don't see her picture on my screen. Um, Robin, are you, is your microphone live? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Ms. Desmond. Can you answer the mayor's question about the technology inventory and the numbers? Certainly. So, um, we, the, um, myself and the IT, um, manager went through the projected student enrollment <laughs> numbers for next year. And, uh, we looked at how many current devices we had in inventory. Now those devices were provided to students for this year, but we're still counting them as part of our inventory. So the 9,000 um, number is less what's out there currently. And that should provide us for with a K to 12, one to one ratio for next year's projected numbers. How, how many do you think we're gonna lose? How many computers are not gonna come back functional? So I would hope that um, we get all of them back, um, but um, you know we 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 expect it. We expect that we're going to have 
we're going to allow for maybe a one third loss and and add that into this nine thousand. We should. So we. Some, right? So we we estimated a fifteen percent loss. Okay. On the devices that, that are currently out. Okay. And is that in this nine percent? This nine thousand order? Yes. It, yes, it is. Okay. All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, Connie, did you have a question? Connie Martin? I did quickly, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, both to Robin and maybe Billy Joe and Joel all together. Uh, I know we talked previously about um, ensuring that the, the requests that had come through the student, um, the student-based funding requests, that two point whatever million for, that came from the school site, um, that those technology requests would be folded into these. So does this purchase accomplish all that? So this, this purchase would accomplish a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, the school-based purchases were to increase um, devices at the school level to get to uh, a ratio that was closer to one-to-one. -to -one. So I think that, that this purchase would um, eliminate the need for the school-based purchases. So that then the, the school sites would be able to, well, I mean, depending on how this all works out, but we'd have the potential for the schools to make additional decisions about those funds because now it won't be coming out of their allocation. Right. And just so you know, like right now, their technology, general supplies, um, professional development, all their non-personnel costs are lumped into one line on the fair student funding um, section. So it's, it hasn't been divvied up until we enter the budget into Munis. When we enter the budget into Munis, that's when they would have decided to put money into technology or supplies. But that was my point last time. If I was, if I had planned on buying a Chromebook cart, but I knew the district was buying it for everyone else, my I would back out and say, well, I'd rather buy the supplies with this. So I agree with um, right. Robin that we're not going, they're going to back out with the technology purchase, knowing that we're doing a one-to-one -one initiative. Great, thank you. Did anyone else have a question before we move on? Any members? Sure. If I, sure. I can't see everybody, so I'm just doing the best I can. Did you, are we all set, Ms. Martin? I, I had a follow up question, if, if I could. All right, um, Mr. Hoey, and then you, Ms. Jardy. I saw Mr. Hoey's first. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is the time, but. Uh, well, no, wait. All the speakers that came here tonight, it's important to hear from people. And uh, I thought they brought a nice message to us. But um, I thought we'd be done talking about this budget right now, May to be honest with you, because um, the way I feel about this, it's still a waiting game. Uh, we got at least, I would have to say, it could be upwards of three weeks. I've been haunting uh, Ed Kennedy down at the State House. Uh, and I also heard today, I hope someone from the team heard it, we just picked up $4.5 million Title I money. And some people are telling me they think the federal government's going to throw a little bit more at schools. Uh, this was something Desi had going down. So hopefully someone on the staff knows this before I do. But that's just one kiss right now, $4.5 million. And the reason why I say we got to wait before we waste much time on the budget. I have questions on some of these pages, but I've been quiet tonight because, excuse me, because I know uh, really it's not ready to talk about the budget. Uh, I think something good's coming. I think you're going to see within, I think it's going to be about three weeks the way I'm looking at the state house and everything, but they're going to tell us something's coming at them. What the figure is, who knows? So I think we're moving in a great direction. I think we need to be real patient right now. That's the real key, uh, not rush into anything. Just keep going with the teams, going plan for that option three, a level funded budget, whatever you want to plan for. But to me, I think we're wasting our time a little bit talking about the budget tonight. And I, I wouldn't vote for ever even thinking about cutting someone right now. It's too early. I know. We're just going to get a quick overview tonight. Um, uh, Ms. Turner is going to go as fast as she can to give us a general overview. I understand what you're saying, um, but we'll just kind of get this brief overview, and then we're going to get into the, the details at a later date. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Darney? 
Did you have a question on technology? Uh, well, thank you. Anna. Other people asking. Uh, no, actually, we'll just, we'll get back I wasn't. I wasn't going to ask specific questions because I thought you didn't want to do that. But then no, you asked not. specific questions. No. You, but you asked about the smart books, and I, you know, I thought they were fine, you know, excellent questions. So I think we need to decide one or the other. But I, I would like to say, I think the overview is fine. But I think that I'm going to completely support Mr. Holy's idea. We've got dates to complete the budget by May 20. Meetings on May 11 and May 18. And I was relieved to hear the superintendent say this wasn't his recommended budget because there's no way that I would support getting rid of the district support specialist. We've been talking for a long time about the social, emotional, and mental health needs of our students. And these are our frontline staff. So the only other thing I'm going to say is I had two motions asking for reports. One was April 15 regarding the factors contributing to the tripling of the high school student dropout rate. And April 23, a report outlining what we are doing to support the mental health needs of our students, specifically the roles of student support specialists and social workers and the professional development for those teams. So I am not, I don't think we should make one more step forward until we have those reports. And I heard earlier in the meeting tonight that I could expect the May 20, when is the budget adoption is dated, slated for May 20. I think we need to put the brakes on, as Mr. Hoey said, until we get more information. Uh, but I absolutely cannot be moving forward with looking at reductions like this when we don't even have the information from those two motions. Okay. I'm and, done. Thank you. Mr. Yep. Um, how many more pages are we going to go through then? I'm almost done. If you, if you want me to quickly just um, go over the last few changes and then. Yeah, I just finish up what you had started. And then, I mean, I agree with what they're saying. We weren't going to discuss this and everything. Just giving you a chance to have a quick overview and, um, and we'll take it from there. So if you just want to finish up. Okay. So we have one, uh, in addition to one guidance counselor, the school, Lowell High School added a career counselor. The social workers, we divide, there's 42. We still have 42. It looked different because we divided out the social worker building base and special ed social workers. We wanted more clarity, but they are there, there are still 42 and 42. The social emotional investment and renaissance support initiative have both been paused. Not the, the actual work, but the additional dollars that we were going to spend have been paused due to the fiscal constraint. Um, Part-time liaisons and full-time liaisons were added during the fiscal and budgeting process. District support specialists, there were three, we're down to one. Um, and then tra transportation has a net of $180,000 reduction between the contractual rate increases on the regular ed and the reductions on the special ed group projections. We have a net of a, a decrease of $180,000. And I, I, then we had an we had an initiative of two hundred thousand dollars for the K through eight athletic and art investment that had to pause for right now. These minor changes, fourteen thousand for field trip admissions that you asked low science idea can't be just um, contract price increases. Eleven thousand five hundred was an increase for contracted tra um, athletic trainer services. We had to go out to bid this year, so the price has increased. Facility area managers, we went from two to one. And with health insurance, we have an increase of, um, of the most of the increase went to the grant section, but we had an increase of 1.2 million. We only see an increase of 641,000 on the local side. That's because more of it, it went to the grant. And last but not, this is the last piece. Um, we have, we reduced the out of district tuition by 551,000 based on the current year projections. Um, we're keeping more students in district due, due to the day school. So we are seeing savings. Um, we feel confident that the circuit breaker account can you know, offset this if we do see any um, additional students come in. So um, that's it. These are all the cuts. If you see at the bottom, it's 6.7 million. That's the general fund change. That's the number that we brought, you know, set, decided on. It's half of what um, I can't see with all the pieces. It's half of what we had agreed to when we when we decided that we had 13.4 million, 6.7 million is half of that. So that was 
an overview of all the changes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Sure. Did you have anything, Mr. Superintendent? No, I think that can, that concludes the review of this uh, budget book. Again, we're not recommending adopt, adoption of a budget. This is simply based on uh, one possible scenario as we talk through uh, at the finance subcommittee. I think what is important to see, as you could see here tonight, uh, we've been extremely prudent with past decisions related to the size of the central administration. This is, as you've heard me say before, an extremely lean central administration. Being able to develop a, a reduction of a million dollars uh, through a reduction in headcount is not easy. Uh, but I do want to communicate to our staff the same message that I have said and said individually to others. Uh, we are fully committed that anything that is even contemplated here is not contemplated in the terms of any planned or projected layoffs or furloughs. This is a discussion of positions. We actually do believe and know that even if this was the scenario we were in and the direction that the uh, committee was looking to go, we would have employment opportunities for all of our highly valued and talented staff. And I want to again reiterate how appreciative everybody is. I personally, as have most people that have been in this business as long as I have been, um, been personally involved in these conversations where your position um, might be considered for reduction. Uh, I did, uh, and I've shared those stories individually out with others that were perhaps impacted here. So, thank you, Mayor. I just submitted this as a report of progress uh, because we are continuing to work through the budget discussion. I do think it's opened up greater transparency. So, I want to appreciate our finance subcommittee members who push uh, for us to move in a direction of having a transparent and public budget book, regardless of the uncertainties that are in front of us. And also to recognize Mr. Hoey's point. Mr. Hawley was referencing the Federal uh, CARES Act provisions for K-12. That is the grant that I mentioned beforehand. We are working on that, Mr. Hawley, Committee Member Hawley, to make sure that we have all of the details of that, and that will be coming to the committee once we have formal information related to that CARES Act grant. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, so what are the dates we have for the budget hearing right now? Ms. Turner? Okay. Um, we have next week, May 11th was a public hearing. Um, May 18th was a public hearing. And May 20... 20th. 20th was the um, suggested budget adoption date, but that was before all this happened. So, all right. All right. Well, what, are, what are we, as the committee, what do we want to do? Well, obviously, we're not going to use dates, I would assume. So, um, do we want to? Uh, wait until the first week of June or um, to see what comes in and wait till we get uh, reports on the 20th. Did I make a recommendation? Sure. Who's that? Can we get the screen cleared and then I can see everybody? Is that Ms. Doherty? It was Ms. Doherty, yes. Sure, Ms. Doherty. Um, I believe that we are required to give two weeks public notice in the newspaper about the budget hearings. Okay. So if we are going to delay it, we should delay it at least two weeks so that we meet the requirements of notification of the community. Good point. Well, right. That's what I just said. We wouldn't have it until June, right? Well, that might be really pushing it. I don't know, because we do need well, time to discuss it. Right. But the council, we're not going to have a budget. I think we're getting a proposed budget maybe by uh, the 26th, but we won't take until sometime in June, and even if we do do a budget. So, I mean, we start we want to know, you know, where the money's coming in from the state, which we may not know until June. Oh, three weeks. Yeah. So, um, looks I mean, like Ms. Martin's trying to come in here. Is she unmuted? Yeah. So, Ms. Martin, Jim, can you unmute Ms. Martin? Yes, did. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, I think it makes perfect sense to get these reports that we need on the 20th. And then, so we'd look to schedule the budget hearings. If you're looking at 
you're looking at Mr. Mayor, May 24th, as to when the council is going to get their proposed budget to you from the um, manager, is that correct? Tuesday, May 26th. Okay. So, I mean, they need our budget before they can give you their budget. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, you're right. I, I thought, the, yeah, all right. Um, but I think the idea of, I mean, even if we get the information on the 20th, if we could perhaps try to schedule a couple budget hearings, I don't have a calendar in front of me, but I mean, we could schedule them in quick succession. I mean, I think we probably need a couple nights, but right. to get that wrapped up, um, I mean, one of the benefits of having gone through this exercise to this point is that we have a fully fleshed out, you know, budget to work from. So we just need to do the review, the line by line review, to then finalize what the committee would be sending to the main to, to bring to the council. If I could ask a question, Mr. Mayor, what revenue projections are going to be used by May 26th? I would say to the committee, the caution is, and certainly this has been the challenge for this committee all along, is this need to meet the city's deadline. The city can't put together a budget without ours, but we're going to continue to be in this speculative scenario because uh, I don't imagine. Uh, I have a couple of calls set up. I have another call. I actually have a call on the 20th with other superintendents. We have been notified not to expect any type of clarity around revenue during the month of May. Uh, so I would just put that out there to the committee as a word of caution. We may still be providing a speculative scenario to city council. And Mr. Mayor, I don't know if that's going to be okay by city council. Um, the re otherwise, you see in the front page narrative of this budget book, it's still based on the governor's projection from January because that's the only thing we have in writing. Um, you know, we. I would love to be able to revert to that, but I just know that's unrealistic. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, I don't know if uh, we can grab additional guidance from council on that as to what you're looking for um, from the from the district by way of revenue projection. Um, but uh, it's it's difficult from uh, to provide a recommendation to the committee, and I imagine it will be awfully difficult for the committee to adopt anything that's based on any kind of speculative revenue. Uh, we don't have internal forecasters within the district to provide these recommendations. Right. Um, Mr. Mayor, would it be appropriate to have the finance subcommittees of both bodies meet to decide what is going to be the approach? I mean, because I agree with, with the superintendent and, and for you as well that you've been saying, I mean, we need to have a coordinated effort. So we need to be speaking the same language and making the same assumptions at the very least. They may all be wrong. We may be, you know what I mean? We may need to readjust this. 20 times, you know, before we're through. But at least if we could get those two bodies together with the with the manager, certainly with the superintendent, CFOs, you know, in, in one meeting, so that we can just make sure we're all making the same assumptions in line with each other. Because I mean, maybe the council isn't going to get, you know, maybe that May 24th number date is just unrealistic from the city side as well. They may be contemplating moving that back, but we, you know, we don't know that. Right. So I think it does make sense for us all to coordinate our timing, coordinate our assumptions, um, so that kind of at least collectively the city can make a, a concerted effort to make some good decisions right now, right. even so recognizing that we need them well. Sure. Why don't I try to organize that tomorrow on the seventh, and we'll get notices out uh, by Friday the latest, and we'll try to meet sometime next week. We have a council meeting on Tuesday, but maybe we can we can fit in a meeting next week with the two subcommittees, right. and then we'll come up with dates. But we're still going to be into June, but that'll be the two week notice. So why don't we go from there? Okay. That would be excellent. Thank you. We still have the 18th already posted, so we're safe on the okay. 20th. So as of now, so it'd be my understanding that the 11th is canceled for right now, right? Okay. Okay. That's right. uh, what Mr. Mayor, if I can also just as you're working to organize those, and I know you wear two hats and chairing council as well as chairing the committee. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion around a 112 budget scenario, given the uncertainty that works for a municipal budget. It would near impossible for the school committee to be able to work through a 112 budget scenario. 
Um, so I just put that in your mind because I know you have to juggle between those two conversations of city and school district. Uh, the 112 scenario, I know most municipalities are looking in that direction. School districts, uh, it near as impossible. Uh, we could do 112 for July maybe, but once we get into organizing our schools, admitting students, starting the school year, it's a, we, we can't continue to go back and forth on a budget. So just as you're juggling those hats, uh, keep that in mind, Mr. Mayor. Okay. All right. So we're all done on this section then? We are. We submitted as a report of progress. Okay. All right. Thank you. So now we're on to uh, the minutes, except in the minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I need approval of the minutes, a special meeting of the Lowell School Committee, April 20, April 15th. Um, the regular scheduled Lowell School Committee meetings, April 15th, 2020. Special meeting minutes of the Lowell School Committee, April 27th, 2020 and place them on file. So they need a motion by Mr. Holloway, seconded by Mr. Dakota. All approved. Um, now we're okay, so now we're going to permission to enter, Mr. Superintendent, or um, who's going to that permission you're, to you're right, Mr. Mayor. There's a, a, the permission to enter is estimated for your approval. Uh, the recommendation is approval as written. There are three outlines they're related to out of district uh, tuition placement. Uh, I would make the recommendation for approval as written. Okay. Sure. With, so with these out of districts, they're still happening this year. Is that why we're approving these? We are required to continue to pay tuition for any student that is eligible for out of district placement. Uh, the out of district placement schools are required to continue to provide services. Um, this assessment is available if there's a more detailed response desirable by the committee. Okay. I think that's fine. Does anybody have a question? Okay, so I need a motion uh, to approve the minutes by Mr. Holloway, seconded by Ms. Martin. All in favor? No. Oh, roll, roll call. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Clark? Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey. So Mr. Hoey? Yes. Yeah. Seven days approved. Okay, thank you. Uh, motions. First motion of the night by Mr. Dakota. Ask superintendent and staff to collaborate with our teaching staff to come up with a strategic plan dealing with remote learning that will include actual learning and beyond enrichment. This should be this should be a plan that is revisited every year and updated, uh, update what is potentially available for our teachers and their students. Seconded by? Second. Sure. Jackie. Jackie, yeah. Sure, Mr. Dakota. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think that the motion kind of speaks for itself in, in view of what we've been facing for the last six weeks and, and, and God knows what we're going to be facing coming going forward. So I think we really have to be forward thinking in terms of what if this comes back next this coming school year, and are we going to be set up and ready to go, get the ground running, uh, uh, so that we we don't lose a minute with our kids. I think we've got to make sure that that that, that we don't get caught with our hands down like the whole state did or the whole country did. I think we need to be prepared for it, and so I think that there are a lot of probably have been a, a, a plethora of ideas that have been germinating uh, all across this country. I think we need to look and visit all of those potential locations and, and get as much feedback as possible to, to make sure that we're not caught again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I had asked today, um, would you mind if we put in a motion um, to maybe reach out to UMass Lowell and collaborate with them and see if um, we could exchange some ideas to make sure we're absolutely absolutely I agree 100 percent okay thank you um all those in favor of the motion say aye aye, aye. Okay. um next motion of the night by mrs Dakota ask the attendant to ask Desi if what we can develop as a plan for remote learning 
could be used to cover snow days, thereby eliminating the need to make snow days at the end of the year. Second by second by Ms. Martin. Mr. Dakota. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I know that I'm going to be excoriated for being the person who suggested sure. that the kids are not going to have a day off, uh, but I think if we can, uh, if we can park in back to a couple of years ago when we had so many snow days that a lot of the districts had to go to school to the very last day of June. I think we need to have something available to us that prevents that ha from happening again. I think we need to have, I, if, if we can get approvals for uh, 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 teaching remotely uh, in, in light of this uh, pandemic, uh, I think that, that should be covering a, a, a snow day. Quite frankly, if we can we can have that all set up, and we know that there's going to be a, 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 a snow day call, that the kids know this is what's happening. You've got this, 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 and we are ready to go. So I think it's a win-win all around. Sounds like a good idea. Any comments? Go, Miss Martin. I would just say I, I absolutely agree, and I think it's a, a great idea for us to get on board with this. I've been having conversations again, you know. Just saying, you know, these poor kids are never going to know another snow day because now <laughs> we know what to do. Yeah. Uh, and it's a great solution that we would have even considered. You know, even the blizzard bags that we tried to employ weren't able to be as effective. But this horrible situation, at the very least, shows us what really our, our staff and our families and, and the district is, is capable of. So I think it's an inspired motion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Thank you. Next motion tonight by Mr. Dakota. Ask superintendent to form a committee task to raise funds for the purpose of obtaining enough technology for every child in low public schools. Second by Mr. Hoey. Mr. Dakota. Thank you. I, I think this might have been a, a before uh, the good news about uh, allocating Allocating funds from uh, the savings of year, uh, but in, in all honesty, uh, I'm sort of concerned with the number that uh, Ms. Desmond said: uh, 15 percent of uh, the uh, units not returning uh, or, or lost considered a loss. But if my math is correct, that's over 2,000. That's over 2,000 computers that we would not get returned. That seems like a really high number, and uh, are we prepared to, to replace that and so make sure that every single one of our, our students across the district has that technology in their hands? Uh, Mr. Dakota, just by way of clarification, I believe Ms. Desmond was referencing 15% of the 4,000 that have been lent out this year, not 15% of our student body overall. So it She's looking at a number of approximately 500 to 600 computers. Okay. Uh, it doesn't make it any uh, easier to swallow, perhaps, but it is a lot less. Yes, okay. That is, that is a lot less. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. That's, that's Mr. Howie? Quick question uh, to you, to the superintendent. How old are these uh, Chromebooks that we have? Roughly? Yeah. I'm going to have to defer to Ms. Desmond on that answer, uh, Committee Member Hoey. Ms. Desmond, are you able to unmute yourself? Ms. Hoey, can you unmute her? The question, Ms. Desmond, was about the age of our inventory. Do you have a range? So the uh, Chromebooks are the newest of the um, devices that have gone out, and um, they have been purchased over the last two years. Some of them have been purchased as recently as um, a month ago. So um, they are relatively new. Um, we have also been able to reconfigure and re-image um, some of our MacBooks for this purpose as well. Thank you. So, Ms. Martin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. To, to the maker of the motion, I, I don't know if you would consider, um, you know, Project Learn is charged with this exact task. Uh, to help in the, the um, you know, raising of funds for you know, specific uses and causes within the within the district, I think a charge to them to focus on this um, could could be effective. Uh, and I also think you know any monies we get from a private source 
to spend on technologies just allows us to back out those funds and be able to spend them on other resources for kids. So I, I, I think, it, again, I think it's a great idea to have this as a focus. And I just think we already have an a, um, a organization that does this work. So rather than kind of pull together another committee to do it, I think really just offer real direction to Project Learn Around. This is an area where we have an express need and maybe to work together on it. I like your idea. Fine. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Any other questions? All those in show up, Mr. Clark. Uh, Mr. Clark, uh, Mr. H yeah, there she goes. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering with the short turnaround and trying to use FY20 dollars to cover this technology expense. Um, I, I believe, I, I certainly know yesterday being Giving Tuesday, there's a lot of different organizations that have been, you know, are raising money for a number of different needs that our community has, um, Project Learning included. And, um, you know, I think I think there will be additional needs in the very near future, FY21 being right around the corner, a lot of unknowns. So while I have heard that, you know, there's work in progress to cover the technology costs for next year using this year's budget dollars, which is, you know, outstanding. Um, you know, perhaps I think just thinking about how, do we really want to make the move to charge them with this at this point in time, or perhaps pull back and say there's going to be some additional needs that we need that might not be tech, but they might be related to technology. I'm just even thinking about, you know, internet access being still an issue and with the 60 day, you know, Comcast, it's, uh, you know, potentially going to run, run out. And we've also seen that others um, are still having difficulty perhaps connecting to the internet, even with a Chromebook in hand. So um, I, I like the idea and I definitely agree Project Learn is a, as the organization that we should be working with to identify what our needs are and then you know, asking for them to work with our community to raise those funds. I'm just wondering if it might, in fact, not be the need because we've just found and identified a way to use these dollars that we've got, you know, this year. So, just something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sure. Let me go to Mr. Dillon and then Mr. Dakota. Thank you. And then, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Mike's, there he goes. Go on, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. While we're talking about technology, yeah, you know, everybody's bringing up good points about. Um, you know, no, we are preparing. This is a positive maybe coming out of this whole thing. Certainly, is uh, you know everybody's uh, knowledge of, or, or skill set on technology has just gone up significantly, you know? and so we can use this maybe to our advantage in the future. But if we are, uh, you know, planning to use technology in a way that uh, you know is greater than we have in the past, I have to keep encouraging. Maybe, get on some sort of release program. And I was happy to see that we went to a lease program. For the stars. Um, you know, I don't know. It, it referenced the people in the technology department, and I, I'm pretty sure they will all tell you that, um, you know, they are they're beneficial uh, for, especially when you're purchasing large numbers of large quantities of technology. Uh, those lease programs update the technology. Um, and that's, it, it's a great way to stay, uh, keep our technology relevant without buying giant, giant numbers of computers that by the time we get them all handed out, time the times. Um, so I think if we really want to keep up, keep technology apart for doing that's that's something that we really need to work towards. And uh, you know, I, I, all these purchases are are excellent for right now um, because Brenda's gone a little bit, but I really think moving. To a, to a lease program could benefit us in a lot of ways. So thank you. Thank you. Before Mr. Dakota, um, Ms. Desmond, um, could you just check into that and get us an answer by the next meeting maybe about lease programs versus buying them? Absolutely. We um, actually um, evaluated that and um, based on the dollar amount that we had to spend and the goal of having a one to one device, we are opting to make a Chromebook purchase. Um, but that is not to say that we would not consider leasing in the future to Mr. Uh, Dillon's point. Uh, but for this uh, scenario, to in order to 
um, stay under the threshold that's available to us and provide one-to-one, -one, we need to make a purchase in this uh, situation. So, but I will be happy to provide you the, the data that we had and evaluated for that decision. Thank you. I'm sure Mr. Dillon, you're muted again. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that, Mrs. Desmond, and, and I, yeah, I understand that that we're you know we're we're trying to take care of our needs uh, for right now. But I, yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Dakota, and then Miss Jardy, and then Mr. Poey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just getting back to the whole technology issue um, going forward and making sure that all of our kiddos have something to in their hands. There's also the aspect of the various programs and platform software that are out there and that are being developed on an almost daily basis. That you know, the newest and better <laughs> you know form of uh, uh, classwork that you can utilize. That, that someone out in, in Seattle just developed, and it's it like the best thing to slice bread. So, I mean, we've got to keep that in mind as, as another cost uh, going forward, not just the actual um, um, units that, that we're talking to buy or lease. Uh, so, I think we've got to keep all of these pet factors in, in mind when we are projecting what it will cost for, for all of our kids to be serviced properly. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jardy. Uh, thank you, Ron. Just quick, and I know you've heard this too, but I've been hearing it uh, from other sources that many districts are doing exactly what we're doing. They're looking to buy up devices, up the uh, technology resources for their students, and that there's a backlog for getting these particular devices. So I wanted to know if you guys have talked to these um, providers of the devices and you know, found out, is there a wait list? Are we even going to get them in time for the fall? And if not, we should do that, right? Or do you have plan B? Yeah, thank you, Ms. Doherty. Right now, uh, we believe that they could be delivered, but there is a backlog. So uh, as Ms. Turner alluded to earlier, that was part of our concern with the fiscal year carryover of uh, purchasing and making sure that they were ordered and then it's still being allowed to be delivered because we don't, in fact, believe that these will be delivered within the fiscal year. Ms. Turner just received clarification on that just a couple of days ago that the purchase is allowable within this fiscal year, yeah. even if it's not delivered till after. Right now it's August, right? Ms. Desmond, oh, Ms. Turner, okay. we're, we're expecting an August delivery. Is that the, uh, I'm seeing that Ms. Desmond or Ms. Turner, did anybody get an update since the last message we heard from us? We're not us? sure. We're not sure if they're going to try. They're just saying that there could be some delays. It's not, that we're not sure. Okay. Yeah, I know some districts have ordered upwards of 50,000. I heard one number for district. Ms. Desmond, you're raising your hand there. Is, are you looking to... So um, that that is indeed the reason why the purchase would be made before June 30th, but the delivery date would not be until August. That is what our vendor is estimating, an August delivery date at this, at this time. And it is indeed due to um, what committee member Doherty has just um, voiced that there are a lot of orders that are presently being submitted. So if I could just follow up. So if we get them in August, what happens if they come in you know, well into the school year? Is it going to be a disruption? Have we got a plan for, to deal with that if we don't get them in for months, say? Ms. Desmond. So uh, we we do have um, some other devices that we are currently working on to convert and um, re-develop, re-image um, and upgrade the hard drives. So they are uh, working devices and they're added to our inventory. So we do have some backup planning that we've been working on. Time starting? Yep, thank you. Okay, Mr. Howey. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking about my one of my colleagues lost the last month. He got me involved in technology. He thought Stock Lowe's school was his school. He really did. He uh, we went down there and we learned that principal where we're going into schools like uh, and 
school site budgeting. Uh, the stock losses school, you know, you hear things out sometimes in a negative way. A lot of them tried, I think, before this meeting is over. But that principal was his own way. I don't know how he did it. He was taking like $20,000 a year out of some type of money. And he made sure his whole school was full of Chromebooks and new projectors on the ceiling that would cost him like 2500 bucks a piece. Uh, I was really impressed with the Doc Losa School, what they did to pack their school with technology. So I'm thinking, you know, we're, we're changing the way budgets happen. Uh, these principals are going to have to make those decisions probably on their own, you know. Do they have enough of this, this stuff old? And they're going to have to kind of do it like he did, I believe. I think he did it slowly. Maybe someone knows, but I know he did it. Thank you, Mayor, for that time. Thank you. All set, uh, Mr. Jones? Sure, Mr. Jones? Yeah, um, through you to Dr. Boyd, um, you just clarify, like, when we talk one-on-one, -on -one, um, we're talking about every kid having a, a, a beautiful personal use, or I mean, are we talking yeah. about that's, we're talking yeah. about personal use, like yeah, individual use. What we and what we envision, if we're able to move forward, here is like if a kid would have a mobile device, as though every kid has a textbook. Now we have to work through a process of making sure that we can develop rollout management training and all of that. But that would be the direction we're working to go. Um, and I think, uh, Mr. Dillon, if you can give me an opportunity to elaborate. It does two things. One is it benefits the classroom in a traditional environment. But two, remember, we had to close schools here on a Friday. We thought it was two weeks. It became three. So if everybody has their own, we can be far more adaptive and nimble. Um, so that is the direction we're looking to head. Uh, but it is going to be sequential. So I don't want to get anybody's hopes too far out there. We're going to order the devices. We're going to manage the devices. We're going to image them. We're going to roll them out in a way that makes sense. Uh, because to the mayor's consistent consistent message to manage risk and, and limit the number that we're losing here. So uh yeah, yes, definitely. definitely thank you. Thank you for the privilege of time as well, Mr. Dillon. No problem. Uh, yeah, that was just my I no that's great. Thank you. Thanks. All, right. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Now we're off to subcommittees. Policy subcommittee meeting. Um Um, Ms. Darney, uh, policy meeting for Thursday, April 23rd. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> yes, actually, we had two policy subcommittees since our last regular meeting. If I could just, yeah, if you talk want about to take them. both up. Yeah. I think for the time, it'd be quicker to just take together. So we met on April 23rd and again on April 30th regarding the uh, strategic plan and looking at really focusing on the first year of the plan, given um, the limitations we've had in our budgets. And I believe that we all got the packet with the most updated plan. One of the, the big focuses of the meetings was to look at, uh, well, especially the second meeting on the 30th, what are the actionable items and how are we gonna measure success at, at moving, making progress uh, toward the plan? So we did discuss that. And in that report that was in our packet this week, um, those pages you'll see they're very uh they're highlighted in red actionable measurable uh within the body of the powerpoint so i would submit that as a report of progress if anybody has any comments or anything to add i'm fine with that i just didn't want to go on and on thank you okay sure there was a motion to approve the one-year strategic all right so you did make a motion to approve the one-year one year um, strategic plan, right? Yes, to move forward with just focus on the one year plan to start. Okay. Yes. All right. So, Sorry, I should have said that. Roll call, a second or third. Just a first or second. Okay. So, roll call. motion by Ms. Doherty, seconded by Mr. Hoey, and then we have a roll call. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Mr. Hardy? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Mr. Hoey? Yes. Yes. Seven days okay. approved. All 
All right, so now we just need a motion to accept as a report of progress by Ms. Doherty, second by Ms. Martin. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. All right, uh, Finance Subcommittee reported on, uh, um, April 29th. Uh, Ms. Martin. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, again, um, so the, the subcommittee did meet on the 29th. Um, attending really was the entire school committee and uh, uh, Rod, the entire um, uh, top level of, of administrative staff from the school department. I'm going to follow Ms. Doherty's lead, and this is going to be very quick. Um, the true artifact that came out of that is the budget that everyone has received and that was posted on Friday. That was uh, presented as a response to the request of the finance subcommittee. Um, so really the, the key things are we had, um, made, Mr. Howie had made a motion um, asking the superintendent to plan out for a level of service budget. That's what you've all received. Um, that's the 50% budget. That, that was one of the four options. Um, so that was approved by the finance subcommittee and led to the, again, the artifact you received. Um, and, then, and the rest was really just a report of progress as the discussion went on during the, during the evening. All of it is represented in the current budget forms. So I would submit that as a report of progress from the subcommittee. Thank you. Any questions? All those in favor? I need a motion by Ms. Martin, seconded by Mr. Dillon. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Um, report to the superintendent, Mr. Superintendent. Thank you. I'm going to continue to follow the committee's lead here. Uh, we're going to continue to provide updates on our COVID-19 response. This one you'll notice here is provided to you in memo form. It's provided for you by way of update, uh, but it, I would submit it to you as a report and ask if there are any questions. The full team is available. Uh, you notice this update is heavily updated around curriculum, teaching, and learning, which have been the ongoing updates of the past two weeks since our last committee meeting. So I submit that to the committee as a as a report of progress and uh, offer to answer any questions the committee may have. Any questions? Just a comment. Sorry, sure. I think you're right. I apologize for jumping in again. Um, I thought this report was incredibly important. Um, and I, I didn't get, it wasn't in my packet, so I, I didn't get it until today. I, and I just thought some of the things that uh, maybe we should talk about is the senior prom graduation report card. Some of those things that um, I think really are uh, impacting our students and our families. So I don't know if if you would like to do it, Dr. Boyd. I, I think the report came from Dr. Guillory. Whoever would like to, I think it should be talked about to the community. And as I said, it wasn't in the packet, so I think it was put online late. I didn't get it until today. It was on. It was in on Monday. Uh, the, the COVID updates, though, we are going to ask for continued flexibility from the committee because this is okay. such an evolving circumstance. So it did go in on Monday. Uh, but let me take the graduation one because I think that's an extremely important one. Uh, first, we're going to continue to make sure that every step we take is with the health and safety of our young people, our families, and our entire community in mind. Two, we're we'll following the governor's lead. We're going to be following uh, the our health officials lead, and we're going to be do working in concert with our city. But three, and I want to make sure I'm clear on this, sometimes people outside of the education environment might suggest that somehow graduation is like a concert or any other large gathering uh, for entertainment. And we know, uh, being in the education world, I certainly know, having been a secondary school principal, uh, that Graduation is a momentous occasion. It's extremely important. It's an extremely important part of the academic experience. It is absolutely nothing like a concert and should not be compared to that type of event. This is not something that we are going to uh, be planning to do remotely very quickly. However, remote is being provided. We're trying to do everything that we can right now to give ourselves the opportunity of time to be planful, I've gotten a lot of ideas from committee members, and I want to thank you. Uh, I've got a lot of ideas from uh, community members, even some have come up from the council. We are trying to be extremely planful, and uh, for any parents that are listening or any students that are listening, we are going to continue to advocate for the importance and the value if it is at any time safe for our kids to convene in any kind of way for an in-person graduation. That's the path 
product that will look to go, but we can only do that when it's safe to do so, when health officials tell us it's safe to do so, and working under the guidance of the governor. Uh, you will notice that New Hampshire put out additional guidance. Uh, committee member Dakota and I and a couple of others were, were sharing that. Uh, New Hampshire put out some guidance that would be quite beneficial to Lowell, and New Hampshire is not that, that far away, but New Hampshire is a different state, working under uh, different guidance, and even though it's only 15 minutes up the road that they may be able to do something different, it is that 15 minutes up the road that does lead to a different governor. So we are going to follow our governor, our state's guidance, and that one I think, uh, Committee Member Doherty, is really important for me to say directly. Uh, for the rest of your requests, prom, uh, report cards, and so on, I'm going to defer to Dr. Guillory or Ms. Desmond, either of you, if you'd like to chime in, Mr. Hall, if you can, Dr. Hall, if you can open up their mics. And, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Boyd, would you mention the two placeholder dates that we're looking at for the high school graduation? Sure. I'm we, not as concerned with prom, but the report cards are, are important. But the, we have placeholder dates, right? That if we yeah, we're get, going all the we went all the way into uh, August right, with some right. with some dates. What we know is this, and we'll continue to place placeholders as they come available. But we know that we can make this really meaningful for our kids and still be timely as long as we can capture our kids before they go to college. Uh, once the college semester begins, youngsters are moving on to their careers and colleges. We think that's probably too far extended for us to really think about this in the, as a life event. It is as a rite of passage. So we've continued to look at dates out for families out into August. But I want to be really I want to caution the community here because we have uh, millions and millions watching this that we are going to make sure that we prioritize safety and we're gonna follow the guidance of the state. So even though there is the hope coming from New Hampshire that it's possible, and though we're booking dates out into August, I don't want to be in a place where we're defeating our kids' hopes again by saying no. So we're trying to balance that. Uh, the exact dates that we're booked, I can provide those as well. I'll ask uh, Ms. Desmond and Dr. Guillory just to pull up and provide those if you want the exact dates, but we're looking to go all the way to August 8th before college and career starts off, we'll go that far into the summer if need be. There's a Dr. Gillian, Ms. Desmond, though, the report card dates and uh, information, if you could share that uh, just for the community's benefit. Dr. Hall, can you open them? Their mics. Right, thank you. Good evening, committee members, uh, Mr. Superintendent. Um, so I think the first question was around the graduation uh, date. Presently, we we have our original date uh, of June 3rd, which is at the Sangha Center. Uh, we have also a placeholder for June 24th and a placeholder for August 12th as backup graduation dates. Um, but again, I won't repeat what Dr. Boyd has shared. Those are the, the contingency dates for graduation. Um, as far as report cards are concerned, we pulled together our uh, school principals uh, as well as our uh, central office support team and also had some teacher involvement in that. And we felt it very important for us to continue providing feedback to families about progress, uh, certainly working with the curriculum coordinators and Mr. Desmond can speak to this aspect in terms of the power standards that the commissioner has given that he would like um, all schools and districts to focus on. So tied uh, in directly with the work that curriculum coordinators and the, the teaching and learning uh, coordinators did in that work. Um, the task force, the report card task force uh, got together and decided that they're working in a non-report um, process like that. So uh, at the time of closure, our eligibility, their report their third quarter report card as normal. Their fourth quarter report card will be now in the remote learning. And so we're making some adaptations uh, to those report cards to give feedback around uh, their levels of engagement and participation. For the middle schools, um, we were um, not quite finished. We were about, I think, three, seven weeks in. So we had another three weeks to go before that marking period closed out, same as for the high school. Um, and what we've elected to do is combine the third and fourth quarters, uh, combine those together and give a progress report uh, in two weeks, and then a final report card at the end, again, focusing in on the remote learning aspects of it, uh, those variety of 
of the various levels of engagement that our students are going through. And certainly the high school took quite a bit of deliberation because they have college, they have the college courses, the advanced placement courses, uh, all of those pieces happening and they put out a comprehensive guide uh, around uh, looking again at combining quarters three, uh, marking periods three and four, and providing progress reports and notes um, uh, for those students and families. We're also in the process of actually uploading all of these documents to our remote learning uh, guidance page so that families can find all of this information in one location on the district's remote learning uh, site. Are there any uh, additional questions or clarifications that I can provide there? Could I just ask one quick follow up? Um, so, are we still doing standards based uh, re re progress reports or report cards? I, I mean, because you did mention that um, that there were state recommended standards. Are they the same state recommended standards that we've always been working under? And if so, how can we expect uh, teachers to be assessing students based on standards when we haven't really had that level of interaction to measure that. Yeah, so, so uh, Committee Member Doherty, uh, what the SE has released is what is referred to as essential standards or power standards. It's the same standards, but it's reduced and narrowed down to those that are perceived to be essential uh, to learning within the year. It's not to say that the others are less important, but when you have less time learning, you don't have the direct interaction. DESE has identified some standards as being those that need to be covered within this year. So those are the essential or power standards that you'll hear. They're a subset of the standards that are overall. Uh, did you want, if you want more specifics, it looks like it, Desmond's ready. Yeah, to it looks like Ms. Desmond, because I'm still looking at that piece, whether it's an essential standard at school or how are the teachers going to be making those assessments? So I'd love to hear, Ms. Desmond did have her hand up. I think she's got more approach there. So thank you. Um, if you look at the end of the report, the Department of Ed released um, on April um, 24th um, some new remote learning guidance. Uh, so uh, they, the initial guidance was March 26th, which was um, a deeper learning on new learning and moving from moving away from that enrichment of what we've already taught. So at that time, the curriculum department created curriculum maps for all teachers that revised uh, where we would be going from that point till the end of the year. This new guidance provided, again, the standards that the state felt should be covered out of the standards that are a part of the, the grade level um, mass state standards. We went back and looked at, uh, meaning the curriculum coordinators and myself, we looked at those revised curriculum maps that we developed in March, and there were very few changes that we needed to make. And so we did outline them in this memo here at the end for both grades K to four, and then also our middle schools, grades five through eight. Um, and so, we're, we're, we were right on with um, most of the decision making that was made very early because we wanted to get away from enrichment. We wanted teachers to be able to move towards some new learning. Um, and uh, so these standards that we've identified have been narrowed down on the standards-based report card. So uh, we will continue with the standards-based report card, but we will be focused on the standards that are outlined in this memo. I hope that answers yeah. your question. That doesn't, I just have one more then. So what about students who haven't been participating? Sorry, I know so, it's, I, what yeah. about students who we haven't been able to engage with? What happens to them at any level? So I will defer to Dr. Guillory um, as to what the task force decided, uh, but I will say that uh, every school is tracking that very closely. Uh, we're working on lots of outreach efforts, um, and I think those numbers are not as uh, large as one might think. So um, I think that we're seeing that uh, kids are, students are um, engaging, um, but I think that, um, you know, the, the, leveling, the level of um, that participation may be varying. So I will defer to Dr. Guillory around uh, sort of the, the uh, what the task force came up with in that particular area. So, uh, thank you, Ms. Desmond. 
<clears throat> what where we are, you're exactly right. Schools have been doing a tremendous out, uh, amount of outreach uh, for families that haven't engaged. And, and we're working with those families to actually uh, build, um, build their capacity. Some, uh, as you're talking about the devices, we recognize as families are just getting the devices that have just recently gotten, so we're making um, we're making concessions for those and supporting those families and getting them up. Um, those families that have not or are choosing not, I think it's the next level of what we would do to if, if a student were in that situation in school. We would start looking at what the next options are for them in terms of supporting them, um, making sure that we have some form of an academic plan for them, either for next year or either looking at what opportunities may avail themselves in the summer. But our, our goal is to push hard to get all of our student, families and students um, involved. And we're monitoring, each school is monitoring that very carefully. And we're watching those numbers tick up closer to 100% engagement. I know initially when we presented to you a couple of weeks ago, we were about, at, I think, eight or so schools that were at 100%. And we're getting, we're getting higher and higher with um, making sure that we contact and reach out to all of our families in that regard. Um, so it will be definitely a case by case basis upon review for those families that are not involved, but uh, each building principal and school team is keeping a close track of those folks. Thank you, Ms. And uh, just to reiterate what Dr. Guillory uh, said, the reason why this report uh, sort of brings together the technology, uh, the curriculum, and the policies uh, is because we, we recognize that goes hand in hand. We grew up to um, five device distributions at the high school. Uh, we plan next week to give out another 90 or so devices to students that have uh, voice that the device they have at home is not adequate for them to get to where they uh, need to be with, with all of their classwork. And so this is an ongoing effort so that we are ensuring that kids are able to uh, do what they need to do. And I, I actually worked with um, Ms. Clark on uh, some of the students that we heard from some of our guest speakers today to ensure that they uh, got devices um, this today actually um, where they reached out and mentioned that they were struggling. So this is an ongoing effort. We're going to be doing this as I said every day. We, I was at the high school today with another distribution. Uh, we also have a mobile uh, tech support uh, tent that is also outlined in this um, document where uh, the IT department is going all over the city and making themselves available to fix devices, help people get connected, and we will continue all of those efforts so that we are ensuring that the kids are able to access their learning uh, and, and be successful. Sure. Um, before you, Mr. Dakota, I'm sorry. So, Ms. Desmond, are you saying that some of the computers aren't powerful enough for the kids, or they're just not working? Mr. Hall? She's mic'd. I mean, she's not mic'd. Yeah, Mr. Hall, if you can unmute her. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm raising my hand because I'm trying to unmute, and I cannot. Yeah, don't um, mute yourself again. If you mute, then you have to be unmuted by Dr. Hall. So just leave yourself unmuted. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. I, sh I should know better since I'm I'm sort of helping with the technology. <laughs> um, so uh, it isn't a matter of the devices not working. It's a matter of, of, of families maybe not being familiar with the device. And so um, what we're seeing is that we're able, and again, I, I want to thank the IT department. They're working uh, really hard to try to support our families. Um, you know, a lot of cases, people don't know how to connect to their Wi-Fi. They don't necessarily know that they have a, a password with their provider. And so, so that really doesn't have a lot to do with the device, but it's that one-on-one -on -one support uh, that's just sort of guiding families and students as to how to connect. Uh, so we haven't had a lot of issues with the devices themselves. Okay, and let me just say that I've been on the phone this week with Comcast, and uh, I know that, you know, and I brought this up numerous times this week that you cannot reach a person at Comcast. Um, they're aware of it. They know that they're trying to do everything through text message or, or whatever email. And, you know, I explained to them that it's not working. And they, you know, for all the money they're spending on their commercials, they should be spending it on hiring some more people to do the work. Uh, 
Um, so I just want to let them, let you all know that the city of Lowell has uh, let their voice be known that things need to do, uh, we need to do a better job with our cable system. Um, thank you. Mr. Dakota, I know you've been patient. Yep, no, thank you very much. Um, this is for the, uh, Dr. Guillory, and referencing again the um, uh, graduation dates. Is there a reason uh, that there are no July dates picked? No, I don't know that. Um, I don't know that there is a, a reason that I was bumped over. Um, I'd have to reach back out to the high school. It could have been an availability issue at the Songus, but I don't want to speculate on that. Why are we limiting ourselves to the Songus? We're not, Mr. Dakota. So, uh, you and I have had still remain in town. All right. Okay. Good. Uh, we. There's some planning. There's some planning, and then there's some planning, and I'll. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Sure, Mr. Howie. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Martin, yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Mayor, uh, number one, because I know you took my phone call today and we talked about having it at Poly Stadium and we had ideas how to split it up. But we can all we can all be very proud of this team that uh, we have right here. The superintendent, I, I heard him on CAP this morning. Uh, those on City Life for us, which isn't easy when you come on with me, it might be a little difficult. Uh, but with all that said, um, all children have been hurt in my eyes, all. I got five grandchildren. Everybody's been hurt, but nobody's been hurt more than seniors, and especially like um, student athletes. They've been ripped off worse than every, anything I've ever seen. Uh, and I know all of you feel that way about a diploma and a graduation, but I feel real good when I hear the superintendent on the radio today. He's not going to forget these kids um, they deserve a graduation hopefully we can uh things are going to happen good i'm going to i'm going to break on that and i do want to say one more thing there before we get back thank you very much linus i appreciated listening to you buddy um i don't want to i'll say more on city life in the morning uh, okay. thank you Ms. Martin. What are you doing? thank you very much mr mayor uh, i just want to kind of maybe double down on the point. So for those students who aren't accessing, whether because they can't or they're not, you know, for whatever reason, you know, have we had conversations with teachers specifically about, you know, what's going to be the process for filling out that report card, for making those, those decisions on standards? I mean, I understand that moving forward, we'll build an education plan to kind of remediate, but is, is there going to be, you know, and, and our, is our teaching staff aware yet of how they should be proceeding to kind of complete this process? So I know that we've been working very closely with our, our principals and having them message this. Um, their families are reaching out to them, um, uh, explaining their simulating circumstances and um, certainly don't need to air all of this in the, in the public forum. But there are some folks that have, are in very dire situations. and so. Um, we are, uh, I think that our staff is remarkable in, in working uh, with uh, the, all of the, our families in that regard. So I think you're absolutely spot on that uh, our staff is uh, being responsive and, and um, to all of our families' needs in those regards. And so, the, again, the idea is we want, to, we want to try to get them engaged. Uh, as much as possible right now. And so that's the big push. So uh, you're absolutely right that our, our principals, teachers, our, all of our support staff are actually reaching out to, to get folks in, as engaged as possible. And those that aren't, um, I think it's when we, uh, we're having those conversations to say, what else can we do to support you or assist you in this process? All set. Um, any other questions? Um, I just have one other question um, through you, the superintendent. So this is what, you know, we've been getting the most phone calls on. So we just want to be perfectly clear for anybody watching the meeting right now. Um, we've got the graduation dates. Those are at the songs. And we are making plans, um, if we get the okay, uh, to possibly go outside. And we are making plans to do virtual, right? I mean, one way or another, we're going to have a graduation. 
depending on what the rules are um, that we need to follow, um, we're making plans for each scenario, right? We want to ensure that we're doing this. Yeah, we're going to have a way to recognize our seniors, absolutely. Uh, there's uh, what Mr. Dakota, or Mr. Dakota was uh, referencing when he said, why only looking at song is uh, he's brought forward different options, different ideas. Uh, some councils have brought forward different options. We're working to be as planful as possible. Uh, I know right now the current guidance is to look at virtual. I don't believe that's the best way to recognize our young people and to celebrate graduation at a milestone that it is in the lives of our young people. So I am hopeful that we will actually receive the New Hampshire type of guidance and, the, and allowing us to do something in person. So we're continuing to build every scenario out and we're going to continue to hold off on a virtual ceremony in hopes that we can ultimately do in person. If we have to do it, but the deadline there, uh, Mr. Mayor, is that August time frame because when you start to transition to that next step in life, whether it be career or college, that's where I think it starts losing this kind of rite of passage and the real experience that it should be within someone's academic career. So we're looking at that August time frame as being the deadline. And if we walk up against that August time without the ability to do anything in person, then definitely we'll be ready to go virtually. Uh, everybody you see before you with that has been involved in these conversations in some way. And I think the real commitment to our kids is we understand the importance of this as, as much as others who are not in education may not understand how important it is. We understand and we're going to advocate on behalf of our kids to make sure that and I think Mr. Hoey put it out there pretty well. I mean, our seniors um, and you, you think about it, you know, our athletes in the spring season, they lost their entire senior season. Um, you know, I, it's, it's, you, you just, it's a loss to that entire experience to the school as meaningful as our, and as hard as our teachers are working, they can't recapture that through remote learning. So if we can, Mr. Mayor, and I know the whole committee is in favor of this. If we can, if in any way, we can recapture that one event, that one opportunity for our kids of an in-person graduation, we're going to try our hardest to make that happen. Okay, yeah, I want to assure everybody that the, the, the school committee here is working just as hard as you are, Mr. Superintendent, and your team. Um, we've been on the phone with our reps, uh, state senator. Um, we understand that the governor is, you know, balancing safety of, of the state, um, but they know how important this is. Um, We've sent uh, a draft a letter from the mayor's office to send to the governor's office to make sure that they know how important this is, and uh, you know we'll continue to work on it. So, that's it. And I think, I think advocacy is important. Anybody that's on this call, I mean, because I, I tell you, I don't want to see Cape Cod opening up those beaches and us be told we can't do graduation. Now, uh, that to me would be completely contradictory to what we think is important in the lives of our children. Uh, so if anything's opened up in any place during the summer that has large numbers of people, graduation or high school graduation needs to be considered within that conversation. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for advocacy. Thanks, Mr. Dillon, for raising his hand. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Dr. Boyd. I uh, just wanted to make it known I have heard personally from the Friends of High organization. They are very motivated to make something happen that, um, you know, whether it be uh, some sort of substitute idea or a virtual or they're very willing to help. Um, so maybe contact them. They're, they're motivated around that topic and getting something done. Okay. I lost track. Where are we now? We are on, <laughs> I know. So we we are on, on the report of um, motions. Okay. So now we're up to the motions. Uh, uh, we we support those uh, for a report on progress. We have highlighted those that are available for specifics. So I'd open that up to questions from the motion maker. Sure, Miss Darty first. And then uh, yes. Well, I think I already mentioned the two motions I'm looking for uh, before we. No, the motion here. The motion about back to work. Report, no, the report on the motion for the. Custodial staff. Yes, that was the back to work plan. I wanted to uh, thank the team that put that together. Uh, it sounds like a very um, 
thoughtful way to keep doing the work. And I want to appreciate, I offer my appreciation to the maintenance staff that continues to work in our schools. I was happy to see that the report included uh, work on the school grounds and also working and coordinating with DPW to do a lot of that preventative maintenance that we really never seem to be able to get on top of in the regular school year. So I really appreciate this report. It, it speaks to you know, really what I was concerned about, how to continue to get that important work done, make the most of the time that we don't have the kids in the building, but do it in a way that's safe for our staff. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Mr. Dakota. No, I, uh, I, I'm very happy with the report that Mr. Underwood took a lot of time. Uh, I know that at some, at some junctures he's been frustrated with different things, uh, but it's not in, on any, not on the city side, it's not on that, it's just, it is what it is, and because of the constraints of safety concerns and so forth. Uh, but I, I do appreciate the, uh, the report. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, sure, Mr. Dillon. Mr. Hall. Uh, yeah, there you yeah. go. Oh, I'm here. Yeah, no, I, I love it. Um, anytime we get our DPW and our custodial staff working together like they're supposed to, I mean, home run. Uh, yeah. you know, so. <laughs> Rick, Rick Underwood has been, uh, he's, he seems like he's kind of been a utility man for the district at this point. He's I've seen him doing a lot of different things, uh, but he got his, he got his work is on board and uh, they're going to have every, they're going to take every precaution and um, it's, it's needed and our facilities can use it. And anytime, like I said, DBW and, and our custodians, if we need to have better communication between those departments and this is awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Howey. Yeah, I just have uh, two things to say. With Mr. Underwood, there's no doubt he's done a great job. But what I'm concerned about right now, do we have all like 94 custodians working in our schools? I don't believe so. We should, Mr. Hall. Yes, um, as the motion um, states, we went through a deliberative process where Dr. Boyd, uh, myself, and uh, Mr. Underwood were talking on a daily basis to see how we could transition back into a full schedule uh, for some time in light of the governor's orders and safety. Our custodians were working on a rotational basis. Uh, but starting this week, uh, they came back um, full time and had uh, full uh, safety uh, precautions with masks and gloves that were provided. Uh, and Mr. Underwood, as you've all recognized, he's been phenomenal. Uh, the weekend prior uh, to the full return, he visited every school and personally delivered gloves and masks and protective uh, gear so everyone could feel comfortable uh, coming back to work as well. And the, the union was helpful in uh, providing some ideas and concerns. Uh, we took those uh, to heart, uh, discussed them with Dr. Boyd, and certainly several members of the committee too are very uh, helpful as well as making suggestions which we incorporated. So I, I hope that answered everything, but if you have any more uh, specific questions. We have a follow up. Um, so if they're all working in the schools and we have no children or people running through it, I would have to think after you clean it for about a week, it's pretty clean. Uh, and to con uh, continue, I'm just curious, where we, and I was a little upset when we put a freeze on hiring when we did, uh, but we did it. Uh, what I'm concerned now is basically one question, how much overtime are we spending? Any overtime? Because if we're putting a freeze on hiring, I think there should be a freeze on overtime. I just That's just my opinion. I'm not aware of any now, uh, Mr. Howie. That doesn't mean some good be happening on a case by case or emergency basis, but I can look into that for you to make sure that that's not happening. But we have been monitoring with various health workforce elements. I'm not against overtime, but uh, when it, times are bad like this, we gotta sometimes look at that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a question to the committee as a whole. Um, so I've been noticing we get this report on outstanding motions and we I think we get this every packet right twice a month so 
Um, do you think there's a need for this? And should we go back to the quarterly report? Or do you think we need to get a full report like this every every uh, twice a month? You know, I would suggest we go back to uh, the quarterly reports unless there's something that I'm missing that, you know, you made this change because of a certain reason. So um, I'll maybe defer to Ms. Doherty and Ms. Martin first on that. Any? Ms. Martin had her hand up. Okay, Ms. Martin, sure. I actually have appreciated getting it every every meeting. I just think it, it keeps us more aware. And I appreciate, I particularly appreciate this format where we do get a kind of briefing of what it means, of, of what's been resolved, and we don't have to necessarily go through the whole report to see what has been addressed. So I, you know, I appreciate seeing that right on the agenda. It makes it much easier. Um, but, you know, that that's... I'm one individual, and but I've appreciated it. Okay. Any other comments? I was just curious. Do you miss the Hoey? I'm always uh, in favor of uh, doing something like you're saying, Mayor, because um, I just believe they have their hands full, just like anybody, a speech pathologist or a parent or a teacher. We don't want to overload them with work. I think it's one of the biggest issues when you look at the teacher survey, it's how many live in a classroom, how much work are we putting on these people to chase after all of our motions? So I think a quarterly and whatever is easier on them. But I, I, I like your idea. All right, I'm Mr. Dakota, did you have anything? I, I, I would like a compromise on that and instead of just quarterly, have it once a month. Yeah, okay. Mr. Dillon, any comments on seeing this all the time? Yeah, no, I was just going to say it does. I mean, maybe. Okay, it broke up, Mike. We couldn't hear you. I think he's frozen. Yeah, sorry, Mike, you froze. Um, All right, no, I just said, uh, yeah, no, I, am I here? Yeah. yeah, now you are, yeah. All right. I agree with you, Mr. Mayor. It seems like a little bit much, but I do like that it keeps everything fresh in your mind, and you you are able to look back. So, but uh, that maybe the one month compromise sounds good to me. All right, Miss Darty. I would agree with uh, Mr. Dakota. One month compromise still keeps it fresh without every two weeks. Okay, Ms. Uh, Clark. Any comments on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. We haven't noted Ms. Jill and I haven't noted any differently than every I think every month or every meeting. Um, but I think monthly makes good sense, and we'll get updates from there. All right. Was uh, once was once annually on the table, or? <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> All right. I wouldn't think of that, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think okay. one month would be okay? I would point out that we're the one who created this. Yeah, I did a quarter <laughs> monthly. Well, it was such a good idea. We kicked it up a notch. Yeah. I'm fine with monthly. All right, so I want I make the motion that we go to a once a month uh, report on this, seconded by Second. Mr. Dakota. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, uh, sure. Min Minerva, who manages all of those ins and outs, I think she gave an eye as well. Excellent. Um, you're on, um, do you want to yes. okay. So now I just need a motion to accept the reports of the superintendent 81 through 821 as a report of progress by Mr. Dakota, seconded by Mr. Dillon. Do you have a question, Mr. Dillon? Oh, you're good. Okay. Uh, new business. Can we have two speakers? Yep. Uh, why don't we let the speakers go first, Mr. Superintendent? I think there's uh, the clarity for the two speakers might have been, uh, I think we're all on the same page with the ending. June 15th is the last day of school. Uh, I don't know if there's, if they still wanted to speak to that. I talked to Paul and I were, or I'm sorry, President Georges and I were able to speak earlier and that seemed to be his one question. We're on the same page, but yes, by all means, uh, I believe Shelby and Paul are the speakers, right? Yes. Okay, so Mr. Georges? No. Yeah, I would just say there was some confusion earlier in the week in one of the versions of the uh, of um, the agenda uh, where different dates were focused. Uh, we agree with the 15th, uh, June 15th. So this, 
July or June, Mr. George? June. <laughs> August. <laughs> August. Yeah. August. Okay. June 15th. June 15th. Right. And there, was then, some, uh, there was some misinterpretation of some of Desi Gatkins. I think we all got on the same page, but it was only after the first agenda went out. That's why I put my name on. Okay. So I have no objection. Thank you. And then the second speaker is Shelby yeah. Bovia. Yep, no objection, objections. We we got that hashed out this afternoon after the second agenda. I mean, after this was updated, and and we're in agreement with the last day as well. Okay, thank you. So, um, if there's any, are there any questions by the committee members? Motion to approve. Okay, so motion by Ms. Doherty, seconded by Mr. Hoey. Uh, roll call. Mayor Leggy. Yes. Ms. Martin. Yes. Ms. Clark. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Seven yeas approved. Okay. Nine two. Revision of the school assignment registration policies during the COVID 19 public health crisis. Um, I need a motion to approve, but do we have any questions on that or? Uh, I can give a, Mr. Mayor, I can give a quick intro. You did the same thing, if you recall, with the grading policies. The committee has the right to suspend its policies at any time. This is another one that needs to be suspended so that we can move forward with a, a new timeline to do this remotely. Uh, that's what's in front of you tonight. Okay. Um, so I need a motion to approve the request for action pursuant to the 20, 2021 school assignment policy of the school, school committee. Uh, and to suspend all registration and lottery deadlines established within the policy and direct the superintendent to implement a revised timeline and remote registration process for the duration of the ongoing public health emergency. Uh, motion by Mr. Hoey, seconded by Ms. Martin. Are you all set, Mr. Hoey, or are you just? Yeah, no. oh. Okay. Uh, roll okay. call. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Seven yeas approved. Okay. Um, budget transfer, Ms. Stern? This is the transfer. Uh, am I on? Yes, this you're is on. Just the transfer moving cost. Um, money into the technology line it's coming from salary line from mid-year hires people that were hired midway through the year coming from the substitute line um it's so we're just trying to fund that two million dollar tech, tech purchase okay any questions uh, motion to approve sure okay. motion by mr star second by mrs dakota roll call Mayor Lee. Yes. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Park? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Seven yeas approved. Okay. Professional personnel. Um, LSAA donated six days. Members of the Lowell Schools Administration Association hereby request to donate 22 sick days to Pamela Daly school psychologist. The motion to approve by Mr. Dillon, seconded by Mr. Dakota. Roll call. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Yes. Sorry? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Seven days approved. Okay. Um, aside from Mr. Hoey, any questions? <laughs> I just, I'm sorry. I basically, I'm more self asleep than you are looking at the calendar. My only concern, Mayor, is on the 5th, we have an election day. I know it's already been stoned. We have a professional development day that day. Uh, but this is a presidential election like never before. Those schools are going to be packed with people. To have professional people, you are teachers in those I schools. Think it's remotely. Right, but this, this counts for this year, though, right? Right. Yeah. 
No, we'll look into that for next year, sure. No, just making sure there's no people doing election data. Oh, yeah. Okay. Any, um, uh, they're going to be oh, You do know that, right? Is that, well, yeah. so, right. okay. Well, we'll figure that calendar out. We just got this calendar, then we'll figure out the next one. But we're aware of that, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, need a motion to adjourn by. Oh, wow, no one's raising their hand. One second. <laughs> Thank you. Right. 